You know when there's something that you're really excited about that you really want to tell other people about and it's hard to toe that line between gushing about something uncontrollably, like a leaky dam, or actually being concise and like a critic about it and explain and break down why X is such a good thing and that people should be interested in it. It's kind of how I feel not only about Taiwanese literature, but Taiwan as a place. I think I've mentioned before, at least in articles if not videos, that Taiwan is my second favourite country. If you could actually rank countries, I don't know how many people rank countries, but I do, I've been to quite a few countries, and I would rank Taiwan as my second favourite after Japan, which is probably not a big surprise. Japan's my favourite country to live in, to travel around in, whatever, and Taiwan would be number two. Whether I'm living there, working there, travelling there, I've only spent about, I think, two weeks total in Taiwan, and I love it to pieces. It's hard to overstate and be too hyperbolic about how much I love Taiwan. So Taiwan's an amazing country. It's an amazing place full of amazing people. It is the most liberal country in East Asia. It is a very kind and friendly and supportive place full of vibrant and exciting people and culture and food. Taiwan is a perfect place in, in so many ways. It's a little bit hot and they have enormous spiders which I didn't know until I went hiking up a mountain and saw this big sp big sp spider. So it's a little hot, it's a little Australia-y. Anyway, I don't know how long I've been talking but I could keep talking about Taiwan. I love it so much. Before you go to Taiwan, there's a bunch of books you should read. Taiwanese literature is really exciting. So what I have here are a few books from Taiwan and also books about Taiwan, books from people who have Taiwanese blood or just history books about Taiwan that are interesting for you to read. I think I've got seven, I think it's seven, seven books from and about Taiwan. So let's dip in. This book is the only one that I actually have to hand and it is the reason that I'm making this video at all. This is Bestiary. Bestiary is a fairly new novel that came out this year, 2021, and it is a novel by a Taiwanese-American writer who was born in California and I think she now lives in New York City, and her family has Taiwanese heritage. The writer is Kei Ming Chang and this is her first novel, and it is an absolute trip. So, first of all, it's beautiful. This cover is an absolute sensation. I studied this cover quite intensely, just kind of staring at it. As I read, I kept going back to the cover and trying to study it in the same way I was studying the text itself. Now, Bestiary is a very interesting book because you can come at it from two different angles. You can study it as if it was a class text that you're doing at university because there is so much meat on these bones for you to pull apart. Or you can set all of that aside and just read it as if it were a folk tale. It kind of allows for both approaches to reading, which is a really refreshing thing. If you want to read a fun, weird, urban fantasy, fairy tale inspired story, you can do that. Or you can really rip this thing apart and look at the themes and look at the way that it explores things like heredity and family and different cultures and the clashing of those cultures and growing up queer and there's a lot, there's a lot to dig into. It's quite difficult to write a succinct plot or synopsis of this as is evidenced by the blurb. If you read the blurb it doesn't really help at all. It's a very surreal tale and you know you could call it kind of Murakami-esque in that regard or even kind of Neil Gaiman-esque, the you know, strange urban fantasy-ish nature of like American Gods or Neverwhere, that kind of thing. And actually there's another Taiwanese author on this list I'm going to come to who also has a Neil Gaiman slash Murakami approach to urban fantasy, but we'll get there. Bestiary is the story of a young girl. It's, I think it's safe to say that it's inspired by Kei Ming Chang's own personal narrative, her own story, at least to a degree, I think tells the story of a young girl growing up in California. Her father is from mainland China and her mother is from Taiwan. And the story focuses on our young protagonist, who is just called Daughter, and her mother and her grandmother, but in a more removed sense. Our protagonist is told stories by her mother that inform her of her homeland and, and her familial history and background. She's telling her daughter tales of Taiwan, folk tales, 
fairy tales, the things their parents passed down to their children. And they're really surreal and strange, as folk tales often are. Uh, but then the daughter, actually, she, she grows a tiger tail for real. And the book then goes into her life and her meeting a Chinese-American girl called Ben, and the two of them exploring their bodies together. They enter a kind of queer relationship, but they're very, very young and very naive, and they have this experimental approach to life, relationships, each other, their bodies, their minds, their emotions. So it's a queer book. It's a book about personal history. It's a book about cultural upbringing and how our stories, our narratives, inspire us as people. While I was reading this book, I watched the film Minari, a Korean-American film that I found out today has been nominated for like six Oscars, and I felt actually quite, uh, there was, there was a real connection between that film and this book, so if you do read this, it's worth watching that film as well. You'll, you'll see a kind of overlap. But this is a very surreal tale. What makes it surreal is obviously the integration of folk stories and fairy tales with the main narrative, which is grounded to an extent, but also very, very strange, very, as I said, kind of Murakami-esque. There is her, there is a, a chapter of her digging holes in the garden, and in her garden in California, she finds letters written by her grandmother, which she then translates and reads together with Ben next to her. Very strange. And so there's a whole chapter, and then a second chapter later on, where it's just the grandmother's letters and again, they are fragmented and strange and written with different grammar and punctuation because either because they're rough translations, is the idea, or because the grandmother wrote in a kind of broken dialect, I'm not really sure. But perhaps the best thing about it is that every single line is dripping with metaphor. Nothing is really written in this book, nothing is written explicitly, Everything is written with absolute fantastical beauty, I guess is the best way to put it. I'm going to read out a few sections just so that you get what I mean, but there is a surreal fantastical vibe that electrifies every single sentence in this entire book, but it also grounds it in a sense because it adds a weight to it. You can't ignore this book, you can't read it quickly, you can't skim it, you can't only half read it. You really have to focus on every single line, every single word. There is an intense beauty to the language. It is poetry. From beginning to end, this is poetry. Kind of like a Shakespeare play, where every single line, more or less, is beautiful in some way. There isn't a wasted word here. It's incredible. And this is right from the start. So, on page five, right at the beginning, you've got this. In wartime, land is measured by the bones it can bury. A house is worth only the bomb that banishes it. Gold can be spent in any country, any year, any afterlife. The sun shits it out every morning. Even Ma misreads the slogans on the back of American coins. In gold we trust. That's why she thinks we're compatible with this country. She still believes we can buy its trust. It's gorgeous. There's metaphor in here, there is beautiful imagery, but it's also very clear and grounded at the same time. There's another bit that really caught my eye as well. So on page 73 we get the introduction of Ben. This is when our protagonist has met Ben for the first time, and this is her initial impression of Ben. And we've all read books before where a new character gets introduced in the first person, our protagonist is looking at them and sort of drinking them in and describing them to us, but this takes that whole moment to an entirely new height. Listen to this, this is mental. It was Ben. Ben of the black top tarring our knees. Ben of the drought-drugged city. Ben of the monkey bars where she swung like a bell. Ben of the bowl haircut. Ben of the sun that puckered above us like an asshole. It was the girl from Ningxia. The one who'd come halfway through the year and could spit a watermelon seed so far it skipped the sea and planted in another country. She came out of the batting cage wearing a helmet. In her palm, a perched plum. She bit it to bone, spat the pit at my feet. It was a fossil I'd unbury later, dating it back to today. The birth of my thirst. In her other hand, she held a feather like an unsheathed knife. She had what my mother would call radish ankles, thick boned and dirt coated, as if she'd been yanked from the soil in the last hour, birthed into the air by her hair. Beneath my skirt, my tail moved like a compass hand, and tautened in her direction. I shut my legs so she wouldn't see. Bloody mental. 
All right, I think I'll leave it there because I could talk about Bestiary for hours. This book is incredible. You'll notice from those two extracts alone that there is a lot of very visceral body-related imagery. Basically, it's a lot of shit, a lot of assholes, a lot of pissing yourself. It's very visceral in that regard. And at first you kind of think, well, it's because she's a child and children shit themselves, but it's it carries on all the way through. It's it's uh, it's refreshing in a way. You don't really see stuff like that very much in books, especially books written by women, especially books with child protagonists, etc. So that was jarring in a really fun way. There's a lot to be said for this book, and I really just urge you to read it because I will not stop otherwise, and I have a bunch of other books to get to. But this one's the most fresh in my mind, and the others I read a long time ago, so I don't have as much to say about them because it's been a while. But Bestiary, man, mental book, just fantastic. As I said, you can just enjoy it for what it is as a fun, strange, surreal fairy tale, or you can really dig into these intense themes of family and culture and self-discovery and queerness and tradition. And it goes on and on and on. Amazing stuff. Really amazing stuff. All right, the next book I want to talk about is Two Trees Make a Forest by Jessica J. Lee. This book came out in 2020, I think, and I've put it in a bunch of articles. You can find it around our website, but it's kind of the non-fiction version of Bestiary. It approaches a Western person's relationship to Taiwan in a very similar way, but this is a piece of non-fiction. Jessica J. Lee, her mother was born in Taiwan to a pair of Chinese parents who emigrated to Taiwan had her and then moved to Canada. And Jessica J. Lee's father is Welsh and also moved to Canada, where then the two of them, the Taiwanese woman and a Welsh guy, had Jessica in Canada. So Jessica J. Lee has this very mixed heritage. She is Canadian, but she also, I think she currently lives in London. She's lived in London in the past. I think she's currently in London, but she's also made a home in Berlin. And she also spends an increasing amount of time in Taiwan because she's been chasing her heritage, I guess. And that's pretty much what this book is. It's kind of about chasing your heritage. And this is a book of history in the broadest sense. This is personal history. This is family history, history of a nation, and even history of a language, geological history. It's amazing how much it is about time. So Jessica J. Lee's book, Two Trees Make a Forest, explores her own personal history and very much her mother's history. She looks at her grandparents, who are both from mainland China, how they ended up in Taiwan, what their personal journeys were, and then her mother's journey of leaving Taiwan and her own journey of growing up in one place, moving to another, returning to Taiwan. There's a huge exploration of Taiwanese geology and flora and fauna. It's a lot of, it, it's, it's a nature book in some ways. It's her hiking the hills of Taiwan, which is a hugely forested and thick and dense and mountainous island. So there's a lot of her just kind of roaming and exploring. And whenever she does this, whenever she's walking around Taiwan, she is considering the history of the nation. So she'll be walking through a forest and she's considering the natural history of this island and how it came to be. Uh, near the beginning, if I remember rightly, she goes on a huge tangent about the physical history of Taiwan and how this island came to be in the first place. And then she's also talking about the linguistic history. Because in Taiwan, they speak Mandarin Chinese and they mostly use traditional Chinese characters, if I remember rightly. And so she looks at the linguistic history of this country and how that pertains to her own linguistic journey as an English speaker, rediscovering her language, her culture, her history, her family, and looking at the relationship between a space, time, language, food, history, aesthetics, family. I'm going in circles. It's amazing how these things are all intertwined. It's absolutely fascinating. She is taking us on a very, very personal journey. It's a memoir. It's also a nature book. It's also a history book. You are going to get so much about Chinese language, Taiwanese history, family history. If you love memoirs, this is an astonishing work of non-fiction biography. But it is also very much a book about nature. If you enjoy reading like the books of Robert McFarlane, you're gonna enjoy this. It covers so many bases, it really is incredible, and it teaches you so much about Taiwanese and Chinese history, especially linguistic history, which I found absolutely riveting. 
I can't recommend this book highly enough, honestly. Two Trees Make a Forest, brilliant name, gorgeous cover as well, a wonderful read. And it's not very long, it's like 200, 250 pages, and there's so much crammed into it, it's incredible. Another one is a pure history book. Everything after this point is fiction, Taiwanese fiction, and this is a history book called Forbidden Nation by Jonathan Manthorpe. And this is a book that pretty much traces the history of Taiwan over the last like 200 years. Taiwan has a native people called the Paiwanese, which I will get to in a second. But this is a book that is just about the history of Taiwan as it was when it was occupied by Japan. The Japanese occupied Taiwan for exactly 50 years leading up to the end of World War II where the Japanese Empire were broke apart and all of the hooks that they had in places like Korea and Taiwan just got released. Up until that point, Japan had kind of modernized Taiwan, for lack of a better term, and explores the history of the Japanese occupation, and then it moves into the rise of modern China and the Kuomintang and uh, the relationship between Sun Yat-sen and Mao Zedong. Uh, Sun Yat-sen being a communist socialist revolutionary, Mao Zedong being the fascist leader of the People's Republic of China. So it's the relationship between Taiwan, which is also known as the Republic of China, and the People's Republic of China, which is what China is today. And it talks about how there is this separation between China and Taiwan, how this political and social separation came to be and what it is and what it means today, I guess. So yeah, it's a it's a general history of Taiwan over the last 100, 200 years. And it's easy to read, it's pretty condensed, easy to follow. If you love Taiwan and you're interested in Taiwanese history and exactly how Taiwan does differ from China and how that happened, and also the Japanese occupation, it's all covered here. So everything from this point on is a novel in some respect. It's a, it's a Taiwanese book. I say in some respect because this first one is Hunter School, and Hunter School is a very personal piece of autofiction. Yeah, I'm gonna call it a novel, but it's very much inspired by the author's own life, I guess, his own personal story. So yeah, I guess you could call it autofiction, maybe an eye novel of sorts. So Hunter School is by Sakinu Aronglong and I'm sure I'm saying that name wrong and I apologize. It's translated by Daryl Sturk, and Daryl Sturk translates a lot of Taiwanese literature. He's very, very good at it. And this is a very, very slender book. It's like 150 pages, I think. And it tells the story of a native Taiwanese person. Taiwan has a very complicated history. The people who predominantly make up the Taiwanese people are Chinese. They are Chinese Taiwanese. Taiwan, as I said, is known as the Republic of China. And there's also a Japanese history there because the Japanese Empire occupied Taiwan for 50 years. And there's also the native peoples of Taiwan known as the Paiwanese, who predominantly live in the hills, in the mountains, in small villages and communes around the island of Taiwan. And this is a story of a modern day Paiwanese person and his relationship to the city and the Taiwanese people and how they live and how they don't live and how they work together. It is predominantly his personal story and his relationship to his father, about what his father taught him about the forests and the creatures in it and how to live off the land. And it explores his journey through childhood into adulthood. And it is very, very much his relationship with his father that is primarily the focus of it. It's fantastic. It's a really enlightening book. It's published by Honford Star, who I've talked about in other videos. Absolutely incredible, small publisher, friends of mine. I adore what they do. They mostly publish books from Japan, Taiwan, and predominantly Korea, that's the big one. I'm gonna mention them one more time actually in this video. Hunter School is awesome. Very, very enlightening. I didn't even know Taiwanese people existed. Even though I've been to Taiwan, I still didn't actually know they even existed. So this is a very enlightening book. Next book is My Enemy's Cherry Tree by Wang Tingkuo. This is an overlooked piece of Taiwanese fiction. A lot of people don't talk about it and I really think they should. It's a very, very strange book. Uh, it was translated by two people. It was Howard Goldblatt and Sylvia Lee Chun Lin and they did an incredible job translating it. The book is about a man whose wife left him. And so he opens up this coffee shop in the south of Taiwan and he just kind of waits for her. This was her favorite town and he opens up this shop and he's just kind of waiting. Meanwhile, this local ex-banker philanthropist guy that the local town really, really likes, he, uh, he says to the protagonist, who I think is a nameless protagonist, he says to him, tell me your story, bear your soul and explain to me how and why your wife left you. At least I haven't read this book in like two years, that's how I remember it opening. I hope I'm right. And then it pretty much follows his life story, our protagonist, his childhood, his time with his wife, his time after his wife and, and why she left him in the first place. It's pretty well hinted at why his wife left him and how, 
and just how he treated her. It's also about his life working, I think he worked at a construction company, and it's a very anti-capitalist book. It's about how working for an entire life, just a slave to your job, how it destroys you from the inside out over time, over years. There's a very heavy anti-capitalist message here, and as an anti-capitalist, I was thrilled. The book drags a little bit in places. I remember being a little bit bored in certain moments. It could have been tightened up a little bit. It has been a while, but that was something I do remember feeling when I read it. But overall, it's a very, very worthwhile story, especially because our protagonist is not a wholly good person, but how he got to be not wholly good is very interesting, and it feeds into this anti-capitalist message. It's a great book. It's called My Enemy's Cherry Tree, and it's wholly worth exploring. It opens up very, very strangely, and it really, really catches you from the beginning. And again, it does kind of move a little bit slowly, but in a way, the slowness does feed into the message of it, so you can... that's a good thing, I guess. I'm gonna kind of wrap this one up with a little bow. <laughs> I don't even know, I don't know what I'm trying to say. Wu Mingyi. Wu Mingyi is an amazing Taiwanese author, probably the most famous Taiwanese author today. He's had uh, quite a few novels translated into English at this point, and one of them was nominated for the Booker International Prize, so he's a pretty well-established Taiwanese author, and his books as I mentioned at the very beginning, they are kind of Murakami slash Neil Gaiman-esque. There's a real sense of urban fantasy to them. They are fun and fantastical. And I'm just gonna talk about two of them because they're the two that I've read. One of them is The Man with the Compound Eyes and the other one is called The Stolen Bicycle. The Stolen Bicycle is the one that was nominated for the Booker Prize. And The Man with the Compound Eyes, I read it like four years ago. So I really don't remember much, except it has a very urban fantastical kind of magic to it. I remember it being a very, very fun book. It's a dark book, it's very surreal. And all I can say is that it really gave me Neil Gaiman vibes. I I'm realizing now that I can barely remember anything about it, but look it up. The Man with the Compound Eyes is quite a trip and it is dark and it's surreal and it's fantastical. If you like Neil Gaiman, if you like Murakami, if you like Natsuo Kirino, you'll probably love it. And the other one is The Stolen Bicycle, which I do remember a lot better. The Stolen Bicycle is the story of a man trying to find out more about his father. I think he's actually searching for his father. But what this book really has going for it is the way that it melds real world facts and stories and information with a novelistic tale. It is a novel, it is the story of a boy searching for his father, but it intersects this with very, very intensely detailed historic facts and information. Stories about bicycles, stories about factories. There are, there are so many real life stories that are woven into this narrative. It really reminds me of Flights by Olga Tokarczuk, winner of the Nobel Prize in Literature. Huge fan of her work, and Flights is one of my favorite novels ever. And after I read Flights, I did think back to this. If you've read Flights, which you should, then this is definitely for you. The Stolen Bicycle is such a strange piece of work because of the way that it blends fiction and non-fiction together. It's a very enveloping kind of a novel. You really get lost in their mind. It's quite a slow burn. You really feel like you're treading through mud as you read it and get into their head and get into their thought space and thought patterns. Very involving book. Circling back around to Honford Star is a collection of short stories, and this is a pretty valuable collection of short stories in a way. It's called Scales of Injustice by Lai He. I know the name is not spelled like that, but that's how it's pronounced. It's also translated by Daryl Sturck. Brilliant job that he's done, as always. And this is not a novel, this is a collection of short stories, and as you can tell from the cover, this is a book about the Japanese occupation of Taiwan. It is... Not entirely about that, but it's all set in that time. Lai He was a Taiwanese writer who lived through the Japanese occupation, and it's kind of his observations of ordinary life and how the Japanese occupation of Taiwan affected ordinary people. You know, th this was a 50-year-long occupation, and so there are people who were born into it and died during it, and both. And this is a book that explores the lives of the people who lived in Japanese-occupied Taiwan. The cover is very, very intense, and I absolutely love it. Honford Star don't do this style of cover anymore, but it's pretty impactful. If, if you do want to know even more about the Japanese occupation, you know, this is, although it's fiction, these are stories written about that time by someone who is Taiwanese and lived through it, so Lai He is a very good authority in that regard. And although it is kind of a history lesson, it's just a wonderful work of art in general. These are really engaging short stories, and everything else on this list is either a novel or a piece of non-fiction, and this is the only short story collection on it. So if you love short story collections, as I dearly, dearly do, then this is a really, really good one to pick up. If you want something Taiwanese, 
but you'd prefer to start with short stories, definitely pick up Scales of Injustice. Also a really awesome name. All right, that'll do it. I'm pretty sure this is gonna be a really long video. If it is, sorry, but I could talk about Taiwan and Taiwanese books for hours, and I'm pretty sure I talked about bestiary for at least half of this video. That was a lot to get through. I didn't even cover that many books, but lists are really hard to do in video form, and I'm still talking, so. If you love this video, if you love the videos that we put out, and if you visit our website and read our articles and like those too, please consider subscribing to our Patreon and becoming a patron. It would help us out a huge amount. I, I cannot stress that enough. So if you've got $5 to spare, please consider becoming a patron. You do get a bunch of bonuses, which you can check out in the link in the description. And as always, subscribe for books.